Welcome to Constructive Conversations, Building Canada's Stories. I'm your host, George Affleck. Thanks for joining me as we delve into the foundations of Canada's construction industry, learning from leaders and pioneers in the business from the ground up. Today, I'm joined by Scott Jacob, President and CEO of Jacob Brothers Construction, based in Surrey, B.C. Let's start the conversation now. Scott, thanks so much for joining me today and having this conversation uh, about the industry and your role that you play in it. Maybe we can start first uh, talking a bit about what, uh, you know, Jacob Brothers is and, uh, and, and what you're known for. Sure, that sounds good. And, and uh, first off, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, yeah, so uh, Jacob Brothers is a topic I, I definitely like to uh, talk about. It dominates most, uh, most of what I do in my waking hours. So we're a, uh, we're a family-owned business. I don't generally uh, present ourselves as that, but uh, I think family business is a bit of a cliched term, but, but we are very much a, a family-owned business. Uh, started in uh, 2008, early 2008, when the economy was so hot that nobody could lose. By late 08, we, uh, we got quite a, quite a rude awakening. But nonetheless, uh, basically, we, we built the company by bringing uh, three separate careers together. I've got two brothers. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got a... Uh, next brother behind me, uh, Todd Jacob, is in the uh, buildings world. I have a long background in uh, in uh, civil infrastructure through a different company. And then youngest brother, a bit of a somewhat of the family maverick. He uh, he had worked for myself and, and my other brother along the way until he decided he could do it on his own. So he was really the entrepreneur, bit of a bit of a maverick. Uh, had been running his own little business. I think he started. It's called Cato. Started that in 1997. Uh, by 2008, I think he realized he had gone about as far as he was likely to with it and said, hey, why don't I pitch the brothers on, on coming together? So the, uh, the idea was hatched in the uh, Magnolia Hotel in Victoria after a road builders conference. And uh, it started with a six pack of Heineken and it became a 24 pack. So it, uh, we celebrate Heineken Day every year here. But uh, nonetheless, the three brothers brought individual crews together. Um, I brought our individual careers together. And the idea was that we'd build a business that was um, uh, very much relationship centric and, and relationships with our clients, relationships with our staff and uh, relationships with the many sub trades and suppliers that we had individually dealt with over the years. So that was the, that was the idea or how it came to be. Um, our business is a little bit unique in this market area anyways, in that we, we do heavy civil construction, which is certainly my background and, in the course of talking to you today, you, I, uh, I often forget to talk about the building side of the business, which is what uh, Todd looks after. But uh, so where we're most companies are either a buildings general contractor or a civil, and they're very, very different bi- businesses. We, uh, we are a bit of a hybrid. We do both. So uh, under today's range, or, uh, in terms of how we're structured today, uh, youngest brother retired about two, three years ago and uh, went off to uh, uh, just live a good life on the island. Uh, so today the business is owned by Todd and myself. Uh, Todd concentrates on the building side of the business, and I concentrate on the uh, on the civil side. And um, in simple, simple terms, on the civil side, we generally pursue um, uh, heavy civil infrastructure projects, some public, some private. On the building side, we do we have a much different client mix, and it's more uh, it's a it's really a slate of typically more private clients. So uh, boutique hotel work, um, we do a lot of uh, water water penetration work, things like that. So it's a bit of a niche market on the, on the building side. Okay. So uh, there's definitely a difference. And cause I think you're known mostly in the public, you're known more as a infrastructure company more, I, I think in general. Yeah, we are for sure. And, and, and how that happened again in early 08, when we got together and said, we, we wanted to be in business. The one thing we didn't want to do was price uh, public infrastructure work where you had to be low price to get the work. We, uh, we wanted to position ourselves as a value add, value added contractor and work for people that truly clients that truly put um, put a, put their money where their mouth was, if you will, and 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 awarded on the basis of quality, safety, and and price, of course. So we like to sell value as opposed to just low price. But that was early '08 when again you couldn't lose. The economy was so hot. Uh, but again, the one thing we weren't going to do was work for these pure low bid gets the job owners, municipal uh, municipal uh, projects or or provincial government. But again. Yeah. Late 08 hit, and um, we kind of had that, ah, uh, what are we going to do now moment? And basically, we, we quickly quickly pivoted and um, and um, decided that, hey, we, we have to get the work we could get. And as much as there wasn't a lot of private work, none specifically in, in late 08, there was a lot of uh, infrastructure spending and stimulus money. And so we quickly uh, dove right into what I really, what the work that came out of my background. And we very, very quickly became typecast as a, as a, 
public infrastructure company. So not by design. It was, uh, it was more by necessity than by design. Sometimes um, that's how business. That's how, sometimes that's how business grows and changes and evolves, just by the nature of what's happening in the economy. Certainly, this past year, we know that that's the case. Absolutely, so. yeah. No, absolutely. If if I've learned one thing, and I I, I don't consider myself necessarily uh, an entrepreneur, I, I suppose I would be described as one. But um, I'm a contractor at heart, and if I've learned anything uh, in the course of owning a business, it's exactly that. You you have to have a plan. You can have ideals. You can have principles, and you have to cling to them. But you also have to be very, very flexible. And um, you know, this this last you know year, year and a bit has really taught us that you can you can have a plan, a well a well formed plan, and you can be well into executing it. Something changes, and um, and you either adapt or you die. So we went through that in early '08 when the company was brand new, and then again in the last in the last year as well. You know, you talk. You know, I don't get in trouble with your brother, so you can you know you can decide on some of the projects that you that really stand out for you, and 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 that you really go, wow, that that was a, those are some cool projects, some high profile, really made a name for ourselves. What are, what are some of those projects that really stood out in your mind since two thousand? Yeah, yeah, good question. And, and as being a contractor and, and a passionate guy, I uh, they're all, I mean, they're they're all my children, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I do have uh, I do have one uh, one child, so I, I get the gig between or the difference between uh, a child and a job. But they're they're all special. Um, but just to answer the question, probably one of the first ones that stands out. Um, it's memorable for me is the uh, the reconstruction at Granville Street, and this was a project that uh, Jacob Brothers picked up uh, in late '08, uh, early '09, and it was uh, it was basically a big city Vancouver project it involved the reconstruction of Granville Street over the entire uh, ten blocks. So from uh, effectively Falls Creek down to uh, Burrard Inlet. It was a large project by uh, by dollar value back in the day. It was also a very, very complex job. I'm not sure if you re- remember the work going on, but it uh, it was basically the facelift that Granville Street was going to get uh, in advance of the uh, 2010 Olympics. And um, what was unique about it, it was a complicated scope of work. It was in line with um, uh, the kind of work I've done in the past infrastructure work. So I wasn't really afraid of the job in terms of the type of work. But I probably we probably tendered it, um, maybe not fully appreciating the scale of the job, and uh, really what was what was required. We, we had to modify the street and the sidewalks from building face to building face over ten city blocks without ever interrupting a, a transit bus or any of the traffic. And while I think Granville Street was four lanes at the time, uh, continuously it had to, we had to maintain two lanes in each direction. That's a monumental task, and uh, we we left a bit of money on the table. We. Uh, Things were really hot in the market, or most of the, the market had been very hot, and our competitors were all pretty busy. We hit it, uh, I thought, reasonably. It turned out we hit it too hard. We left a boatload of money on the table, and um, and that's not uh, that's not where you want to be when you're a, a startup. And uh, we caught a lot of attention really quickly. Like, wow, I think the word on the street was these Jacob brothers. They came from nowhere, and they're going to be they're going to be gone before they get started. But nonetheless, it uh, ended up being a, a spectacular job for us. We um, we almost didn't get awarded. Funny enough, a little side story. Uh, ended up uh, typically your your little bit you get awarded. I think given the profile of the project and given the importance of it being done in time for the 2010 Olympics, we uh, uh, before the city awarded that actually had to appear in front of. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if it was all of mayor and council, but there, there was a formal meeting within the city chambers to, to basically where there was going to be a discussion about whether or not we got awarded. And things weren't looking good. It was uh, it was looking like the city didn't have confidence enough in us, even though we had bonded the job and whatnot. The, uh, the city was going down the path of, hey, this just wouldn't be in the city's best interest to award. And I was given the rare option of walking on, walking on the job uh, without uh, forfeiting a bid block. And that's that's I won't say that's unheard of, but typically if you if you're low bid and you don't take the award, you, you lose the bond. But nonetheless, the city offered me a chance to walk away. And I think just the competitive streak in me, when, when the city said I couldn't, I kicked into a mode of I, I want this job. We can do this. And uh, anyhow, long story short, we uh, I, I basically pitched with everything I had that, hey, we might be a new company, but we're not new to the business and are new to the industry. And, uh, and I assured uh, everybody in the room that they'd get, they'd get the very best of Jacob. You get a brother on the job. And uh, funny enough, I had done a bunch of work for the city also back in the uh, early, early 90s on the Expo lands. And it just happened that somebody that had risen to a position of prominence within the city of Vancouver engineering side was in the room. He recognized my name and, and, or, and or my face from the 90s and uh, had said, uh, effectively stood up and said, hey, if, uh, if Scott's going to be on the job, uh, it'll go well. 
And so uh, it was a really exciting job. We were able to negotiate a, a different way of doing the job with the merchants and the, uh, and the city. The uh, downtown Vancouver Business Association, were, they were terrific to deal with. Uh, Charles Goche, who's still around. And we basically found a way to hit the job hard, build it different than the city it had anticipated, and deliver it um, segmentally, uh, thereby minimizing the impact. So very, very uh, defining job for Jacob Brothers. It was early, early in, uh, in our um, history, but it was also at a time when others didn't have any work. And so we went from being kind of the laughing stock of the town for being so aggressive on the job to one of the few contractors that actually had a big chunk of work. And uh, that was very much uh, defining for our brand. We, uh, whatever we, whatever we were when we started that project, we were a very different entity, and, and we had actually made our mark significantly by the end of it. And of course, it uh, it turned out well. We got done on time, in spite of all manner of challenges and extensions. Uh, so much so that we got a great a great letter from then Mayor Gregor Robertson, just basically uh, singing the praises of this this company that delivered the impossible. So that that one stands out for sure. I think it's inspiring for other companies who might be listening and, and watching this and, you know, the multiple complexities of that. I mean, you had to deal with government. You had to, you know, do an RFP. The project itself was complex. The politics of Granville Street, of course, and all the other stuff that goes along with it are, are complex. TransLink, another plunk. You've got five or six different layers of complexities that uh, you are thrown into the deep end on that one, for sure. Absolutely. Some, yeah. Probably uh, undercharged, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you recall, uh, the, uh, the Canada Line had just, the, the cut and cover on Canby Street had just happened. And I mean, the merchants on Granville Street were in an uproar before we even started. They they just, they had heard all of the stories about how things went poorly on uh, Canby. And of course, there were a lot of people up in arms. One of, one of the things we did is I recognized that um, that challenge area. And we hired what I what I refer to as a public liaison person. And funny enough, he's a fellow from my personal life who had actually sold cars for years, knew nothing about construction had uh, gotten disenchanted with the car business and left it, had been unemployed, kind of just his wife was a high-profile lawyer. And he he was not working. He was kind of the house husband. And I, I, I thought, this guy has great people skills. Why don't I give it a try? And it was fairly innovative at the time. We hired him, and he he walked up and down Granville Street every day, all day. And his job was to make sure that as a non-construction guy, but a business guy, he spoke with the businesses and, and – um, um, basically work with the businesses to help understand what was important to them. And then he knew enough about construction that he'd, he'd talk to the merchants, find out what they needed, and then come back to the construction team and say, look, this is, this is what matters to these guys. May or may not have been compliant with the spec, uh, but it was, you know, if, if they didn't need wheelchair access, they'd tell us that if they did, they would. Uh, you know, and, and it was a really interactive way of dealing with them. It worked beautifully. That can because that, that kind of stuff can really backfire on it. from a public relations point of view. You look at that can be and you, you don't want to take the heat for that. I mean, there's the politics, but then there's just to to have that process that you created yourself, basically a community engagement, ongoing community engagement. It's very unusual. Have you used that since in, in other projects where you thought let's let's make sure we stay engaged with the neighborhood in, in a way like that? Absolutely, absolutely. It's become a, a real uh, uh, a cornerstone of how we do business in, in busy areas. Uh, and, and we've done a lot of work for the city since then. Uh, Granville Street earned us some nice stripes with, with City of Vancouver. And, and the city is, um, lots of contractors consider City of Vancouver to be difficult to deal with. Uh, I don't at all. I think they're, uh, they're perhaps a needy owner. Um, but um, but they're, they, they have certain priorities. And if you, if you look after the priorities, I find them quite good to deal with. And uh, we've used a very similar approach on different things. Most recently, we did a bunch of work for Cadillac Fairview on Georgia Street. Similar project, basically rebuilt a critical chunk of Georgia. Same, same approach. We had a public liaison on the job. Uh, we actually started the work um, before COVID hit. And um, we had very, very strict um, guidelines and limitations in terms of what we could do relative to traffic. And, and those rules were all developed pre-COVID. They didn't actually make sense during COVID because, as you know, uh, the city center was pretty empty. Bottom line, by working with the city proactively and by working with uh, this public liaison, we ended up building the job in an entirely different way. It got finished early, capitalized on the fact that the city was um, the city was basically empty, and uh, worked really interactively and, and to the to the benefit of everybody. So that 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 tends to be our style. That's, that's what we like. Which one? Uh, you know, does it does um, residential and commercial? Which of those fields do you think now moving forward has the best potential for growth as a business and, and to, you know, to inspire other companies out there who might be thinking, what's the opportunity out there? Is it commercial or is it, uh, is it in the residential sector for a project? 
You know, I I, uh, I think it's difficult, really difficult to tell in in, in today's world where where the where the uh, strongest market's going to be. Um, and our strategy certainly is to work both areas. Um, I, I think this. I'm I'm expecting a general slowdown on uh, on the commercial side of things. I don't think uh, I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to to to, to assume that um, all the empty office space downtown is going to uh, going to take a little while to get filled up again, and therefore the demand for new office space is going to be off. So my my expectation is um, commercial is going to going to dip. It's still strong today, but I think we're going to see that slow down. Uh, public infrastructure, I think, is probably the, the the growth area. Certainly, that's where we're looking. And uh, while we haven't seen a lot of uh, federal stimulus money, I think it will eventually flow, and that uh, that tends to lead more towards private or sorry, public work. So that's that's what we expect. Um, the residential side, and we do a little bit of high end residential. I'm uh, I'm amazed at how strong the residential market is. I uh, I would have bet any amount of money uh, six months ago that we wouldn't see what we're seeing. So. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball that's any better than anybody else's, but for for my dollar, I'd say public infrastructure. You think it's because there's going to be a huge infusion of uh, of investment from government that will provide a lot of opportunity out there across the country, potentially? I, I, I'm hoping for that. I, I think we will see that. Uh, the spending has been huge to date. I, I you know, the, the taxpayer in me asks if, uh, you know, at some point, will we run out of funding? But I think a couple things happen. In- infrastructure uh, wears out or, or ages every every year, whether whether you want it to or not. And uh, certainly there hasn't been like 20, uh, 2020 and now even 2021, there hasn't been a lot of infrastructure spending. So I think I think there's some pent up demand. So between that and what I expect to be uh, federal and provincial dollars flowing in the form of stimulus, it uh, it should be strong. One of the things that the point, I suppose, that there might be that infrastructure spending by the government is to infuse the economy. But you're still having challenges. I mean, when I speak to other owners of of companies like yours, uh, getting great employees is still a, is still a tough a tough battle. It's, there is a skills shortage in the industry, uh, you know, and you know that's still a problem. So how do you deal with that problem while also seeing potentially a huge need for your work? Yeah, and I, my my favorite answer to any question is or any challenge is just work harder, outwork outwork those we compete with, and and my staff get tired of hearing that. But but honestly, we've uh, we've changed our business. Uh, you know, if uh, we we have a, an on staff in house uh, professional recruiter, I, I would never have thought that to be necessary. So basically, I think there are good people out there. We just have to work harder to find them. But but there's no question. I mean, we've the construction industry has been hearing about the skills shortage for I've done a lot of association work over there. Twenty years ago, I think CCA and some of the other big organizations were talking about this pending skill shortage. And I think I think it's been happening. But I think every time we get closer to D Day, you know, in terms of just workers retiring and what have you, something happens, whether it's COVID, whether it's another, you know, uh, an economic meltdown, something happens and it kind of gets pushed out a little bit. But I think what happens is it, it's been it's maybe not as pronounced or as immediate as maybe uh, industry thought it would be, but it's there for sure. And there's and there's two ways that there's a shortage. One is just getting enough bodies to staff the projects. And that's a challenge today as much as it was two years ago. Uh, but over and above that, it's getting the right bodies. And uh, in my mind, it's you really have to emphasize the fact that it's a skilled labor shortage. Uh, and, and some of these are uh, uh, red seal trades. Some of these are just skilled labor positions. That's the challenge. So I think there's lots of employees out there. There are lots of people that were displaced in one industry that could potentially come to the construction industry. But by and large, they're not doing that. By and large, we don't have people coming in from other provinces, Alberta and so on. By and large, they don't come this way. And by and large, people that were, I don't know, baristas at Starbucks, they don't become pipe layers or laborers. So I think um, I think the industry has its uh, has its challenges in front of it from a labor perspective. D, so... Um... How do you, um, if, if, when you have the issue of also different levels of skill sets, because you mentioned that, you've, but you also have the engineers you have, is there the same problem on all levels, do you think? Absolutely, yeah. Are we, um, I'll, I'll pick on the consulting engineers, for instance. I mean, the, the quality and the timeliness of, of engineering on our projects has gone downhill steadily. And uh, they, and quite honestly, they face the same problem we do. And, and at least as a contractor, typically we pay more than the consultants do. So the people that turn contractors down for uh, for a higher wage um, are uh, are not likely going to go to consultants for a wage that's even lower. And so yeah, you see it in all all directions. Uh, I think I think every every element of the industry, whether you're an engineer, whether you're a general contractor, subcontractor, I I think the problem is real and it exists for all of us. Uh, and then depending on the complexity of your business, you you either find a fairly straightforward way through it or or you don't. 
but it, it's a challenge and it's not going away. You talked about red tape earlier and how your relationship with the city of Vancouver wasn't so bad and, and you've had, you found your way to navigate uh, through the projects you're doing in Vancouver, but in general, uh, what role does and, and challenge does the red tape that uh, governments, you municipal, provincial, federal, whatever it might be, uh, you know, play in, in, in effect how you work and, and, and the success of your work and the profitability of your work? Yeah, I, it, it's it's a good uh, it, it's a good thing to talk about. Um, I think I think red tape is growing uh, at all levels of government, and and quite frankly, we we see it just in terms of uh, the challenges of getting a job to to tender. So so projects that were supposed to happen in 2020, uh, maybe for for a variety of reasons, red tape uh, permitting and so on, don't actually get tendered until a later period. That makes it difficult for you to have staff and anticipate and be ready. Um, but open above that, the one that, that hurts us dramatically and affects profitability is, so the project gets tendered, there's, uh, you, you anticipate, you submit a schedule, you anticipate an award date, the start of construction, and then, and then some bureaucratic thing isn't ready. It might be permitting, it might be, uh, uh, uh First Nations challenge, who knows? There's, there's different things that, that maybe aren't ready. And so now you're the contractor, you're, you've got your team pulled, you, you've, you've sim- submitted a tender that says you're going to get such and such a team. You hold that team and the delay, the job start is delayed. That's, uh, that's absolutely catastrophic to a contractor. All those people have to get paid. They're not available to be assigned to another project. They've got to be paid. Uh, one example, we're working down at um, Centrum for uh, Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. We're, we're part of a joint venture doing a, a $400 million expansion. It was a design build process. So we, we competed with the masses. We got shortlisted. So we were one of three. Ultimately, we went on to go from RFQ to RFP. We submitted. We were the successful proponent, announced that. Uh, but the port uh, was waiting for, I think, a uh, couple of levels of, of environmental approvals and also a railway permit. Bottom line, they put the project on hold for what became a year. In the span of that year, the, uh, our partner, Dragatis, who's an international company, the team that they had in town who had been on the South Fraser Perimeter Road, they all they were loosely ear tagged for the centrum job. In the span of a one-year wait, everybody has to get paid and stay productive. They got pulled over to a different market area, specifically Ontario, Fast forward, the job got awarded a year later, then we got caught a little bit flat footed in that, uh, you know, the team that we had dedicated weren't available. And and again, that's not an insurmountable problem, but it makes for a bumpy start and it makes for, you know, a challenging relationship between the contractor and the owner. And the owner doesn't necessarily fully appreciate how hard it is to hang on to people. And again, if you if you work for a public entity, you know, maybe maybe staff just get kept busy doing something else, but they're generally there. For a contractor, it's very much use them or lose them. You uh, you can't pay people in this business if you don't have them on a project. So that's the challenge. And that's kind of really that's your challenge more than anybody because they just say that's why I'm paying you to figure that out. Don't 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 bug me with your problems. Yeah, yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There there are not a lot of owners that are terribly sympathetic to a contractor that says, "Hey, I uh, I've got these people sitting. Help me out." That's that's a contractor problem for sure. You've talked uh, about an infrastructure um, um, infrastructure emergency rather than an infrastructure deficit. Can you explain what you what you mean by those? What's the difference between those two things? I, I think I think an infra- I think they're they're close cousins. They're they're related. But I think I think that an infrastructure deficit becomes an infrastructure emergency. Um, it, it's a function of time. I mean, I think one of the things that happens, one of the things that society does, is when times are good. Um, you, you invest in infrastructure and you make sure it's kept in good condition and you do, you proactively do repairs before things fail. I think that it's just the reality of life that when, when times are tough and there isn't enough money to go around, you start to neglect infrastructure. And, um, and, and, and then, and then that's when I think you get into this infrastructure emergency. I think we are in the latter. I really do. Um, I've done a lot of work with BC road builders over the years. Road builders put a document out once upon a time, probably a decade ago, and the document was called Good Roads Cost Less. And it was a study that road builders con- commissioned to look at the cost of maintaining a strip of road, a highway, for instance, uh, when you proactively made repairs, as opposed to the cost of rebuilding it once things failed. And it's dramatic. I don't remember the specific numbers, but it's uh, it's it's not um, it, it, it's fact that infrastructure once infrastructure fails, a complete rebuild is a lot more costly than than maintaining infrastructure along the way. Uh, Pavement, a pavement surface comes to mind. I mean, if you if you keep a pavement surface, the, the actual wearing surface in good condition, you'll get a much longer life out of it than if you let the asphalt surface fail. You start to then have damage to lower layers, and uh, now now there's not a topical repair. You've got to basically completely reconstruct. That that would be my uh, that would be my version of infrastructure emergency. 
One of the things you've been in your career is you've really given back. You've been on boards, you're involved in your community, uh, and you provide your expertise, uh, which is important. For people listening and watching, uh, you know, can you tell us about what's what's one of the things that you, one of the most important things you've ever learned uh, during your career in, in the industry? That's a good question. Um, I, I, first of all, I think the construction industry is, is one of the greatest industries uh, that a person can be involved in. It's it's filled with characters. It's filled with real people. Um, uh, there there are just a tremendous number of people that are very very passionate about their job and. I, I think one of the things about construction is that it, it's either in your blood or in your heart or it's not. And if it is, you can't help yourself. Uh, there are lots of days it doesn't make sense to work as hard as you do for the return you get. But um, but even on a bad day, I get to drive home, look in the rearview mirror at what I built and, and, and get a feel good. And I think I think because of that, you get a lot of people with a tremendous amount of um, <coughs> uh, sorry, tremendous amount of passion or, or uh, commitment for what they do. Um, so in terms of my, my own career, I, I was lucky. I started young. Uh, uh, we were sons of a carpenter, so we, we grew up working for my dad. It wasn't, um, wasn't an option, really. It was, you, um, if you want to eat, you want to sleep under my roof, and you want to eat my food, you're going to be out splitting wood or, or building this or building that Friday nights or Saturday nights or Saturdays, whatever. So, so I, I grew up in the construction industry. I got involved in my own career pretty young. I think I was 24 when I... Uh, became a construction superintendent, but I, I worked for a, fam- a different family business, and they really instilled the importance of giving back to the industry. And so, uh, I think at uh, uh, I think by the time I was certainly before I was thirty, I was heavily involved in uh, various construction associations. I believe I chaired the uh, Victoria Construction Association when I was twenty-seven years old, and it was uh, I wasn't qualified to do it, quite honestly. And I, I I dealt with some crusty old guys that reminded me I really was too young to be there, but. I got an early look at what it means to give back. And I, I think the message I'd give young people or anybody that's interested in getting involved is um, you get back way more than you put in. It's, uh, I think that's the best kept secret in, in construction. Uh, yes, you give up some evenings or some weekends or you work some long days to do industry association stuff off the corner of your desk. But, uh, but the contacts you make and the, uh, the opportunities you see are huge. So I, uh, I, would, I would encourage anybody in this business to, to stay involved and get involved. And, and typically, it's not the big companies. It's not the big multinationals that help ICBA or BC Road Builders or BRCA uh, work. It's, it's the little guys. And um, you, can, you can resent that as a small guy. I consider us a small guy. You, you, can, you can think it shouldn't be that way. But I, uh, I would rather focus on just all of the return that we've been able to generate personally and also for our company by, by being involved. So it's, um, I think that's the best kept secret. I really do. Well, Scott, on that note, I really appreciate you taking time today and uh, thanks very much. Okay. You're welcome. I'm George Affleck. Thanks for joining me at Constructive Conversations, Building Canada Stories, where we dig into the foundations of Canada's construction industry, learning from leaders and pioneers in the business.